Yuza, and I will be your presenter for this week's lecture. The topic for this week's lecture is historical injustices, colonialism, and indigenous peoples then and now. So there are two readings uh, for this week. The first one is by three authors, uh, Liu, Greenwood, and Cameron. And that one is titled Deviant Constructions, How Governments Preserve Colonial Narratives of Addictions and Poor Mental Health to Intervene into the Lives of Indigenous Children and Families in Canada. The second reading was by Blackstock, and it is titled The Occasional Evil of Angels, Learning from the Experiences of Aboriginal Peoples and Social Work. So I found that both of these readings really got me thinking about my own knowledge of the Aboriginal community and how my way of practicing may affect them. So my hope is that you all found the readings just as insightful as I did. And hopefully uh, during this lecture, you will be able to draw upon the readings and uh, use them for this week's learning exercise. Okay, so moving on to our next slide, we have the agenda of the presentation. So just to go over it briefly, I'll spend majority of the lecture analyzing the readings and really trying to understand how the organizations that we work in can really affect our clients as well as ourselves as social workers. Next, I'm going to be explaining my weekly learning exercise that I would like you to complete. And then lastly, I will leave you with my contact information in case you have any further questions or concerns about the presentation. All right, so the first reading by uh, Liu, Greenwood, and Cameron analyzes the experiences of Aboriginal communities through the social determinants of health perspective. So for those of you who are not familiar with this perspective, it basically looks at the living conditions of a population and how those conditions affect those people's daily lives. So after analyzing Aboriginal issues, um, we can understand why things happened the way that they did in the past, um, like residential schools and deterritorialization, which um, are topics that will both be covered in the upcoming slides. So basically what the authors are trying to say here is that Aboriginal issues are not individual problems, but rather they are to be recognized as historically informed and socially produced. So one of the examples from the reading was the impact of residential schools on the health of Aboriginals. Unfortunately, many people in our society are ignorant about the impacts of residential schools because they feel like, oh, well, it happened a long time ago. However, in reality, the impacts of residential schools are still very much prominent today. So to show this, I've kind of arranged a sequence of events here, just to show how the past leads to the present. So in the first box, we see loss of language and cultural fluency. Uh, so this stems back to the assimilation that Aboriginal children experienced in residential schools. So since they were not able to practice their own traditions, they experienced cultural trauma and lack of social cohesion, which is what we see in the next box. Not being able to express their own identity really paid a toll onto these Aboriginal children. As a result, when we see and hear about what is in the final box, which is addiction and family violence, it is crucial that we take the time to consider what was in the previous boxes uh, because then we can truly grasp and understand how these issues are caused by society over time rather than by the individuals. Unfortunately, this blaming the individual idea that we've heard about many times in our social work class um, gives the idea that our society is neoliberal and that everybody is to blame for their own problems. Another example that the authors give us is the impact of deterritorialization. So as we've learned before, again in social work, the colonization of Aboriginal land by Europeans really disrupted the Aboriginal community as a whole. So being forced off their land meant that Aboriginals were faced with problematic housing conditions. Some of these conditions uh, that exist uh, that you see here on the screen 
includes high risk of house fires, higher likelihood of catching disease, and an increased exposure to mold. So these types of living conditions are clearly not acceptable. But unfortunately, um, these living conditions are often the reason that Aboriginal children are being apprehended by CAS from their family homes. So as social workers uh, working in agencies uh, like CAS, for, for example, we must need to understand that the problematic housing conditions are a result of colonization. And Aboriginal families should not have to be punished for something like that. By not attempting to address this and to make improvements uh, to Aboriginal housing conditions, the government is and the organizations that we work for are basically upholding uh, the colonial way of thinking. So another part of the reading that really stood out to me was the part about legislations. After reading what each le legislation was about, I noticed a lot of assumptions about Aboriginal people. So for instance, um, the first legislation, the report of the affairs of Indians in Canada, documented Aboriginal behaviors so that Aboriginals could be managed. So this uh, creates that assumption that Aboriginals are in need of structure, especially from those who are in power, uh, who are not Aboriginal. Uh, so that it stems the idea that Aboriginals are badly behaved. The Act for Gradual Enfranchisement of Indians uh, said that the government may need to take money from each tribe's fund if they noticed a member of their community was sick or disabled. So here we see the implication that Aboriginals do not take proper care of those in need and that the government uh, would need to step in and help them. This act also stated that an Aboriginal woman who married a non-Aboriginal man would lose her status. So this gives the impression that Aboriginals should stick to their own kind uh, because everybody else is considered superior to them. The last act that I want to mention is the Indian Act. So this act stated that Aboriginals can enter bars or can purchase alcohol. So the assumption for this act is that Aboriginals cannot appropriately handle alcohol themselves and that they need to stay away from it or else they will become alcoholics. The other part of this act was the punishment of parents who did not send their children to residential schools. So because there was an assumption uh, of the government that assimilation is the proper uh, way of upbringing Aboriginal children, um, parents who did not send their children to these residential schools were seen as not having the best interests of their children. All right, so the second reading is by Blackstock. I found Blackstock's reading to be very critical, which is good because it really forces us to uh, critique ourselves and our way of practicing. Uh, what I found to be the main idea that Blackstock puts out to the readers is around how social workers can reproduce colonial ideals through their practice. And even though it may not be intentional, uh, it still is happening nowadays. Uh, so one of the big issues that Blackstock brings up in the reading is the traumatic past that Aboriginals have had with service providers um, and with people in power. So for instance, uh, the Catholic Church ran the residential schools uh, social workers would ship many children off the reserve in the 60s scoop. The Canadian Association of Social Workers never really advocated towards closing down residential schools. And uh, the Children's Aid Societies never intervened in schools' deaths, despite the fact that they were aware of them. So situations like these are embarrassing for professionals like ourselves in the field. Because as social workers, we should be helping people. Um, but this history kind of shows us as pretending like Aboriginal issues don't exist. So unfortunately, professionals uh, like social workers ourselves, our behaviors in the past have caused a lot of mistrust with the Aboriginal community. So what really is important here is for us to rebuild that trust, or try at least to rebuild that trust. 
And we can do this by acknowledging the fact that our past has been very harmful with the Aboriginal community. And another way that we can build this trust is by taking action, which is what leads me into my next slide. So in the past, social workers and governments and agencies, organizations have been known for talking the talk, but not walking the walk. And when I say this, what I mean is we often make excuses and promises uh, because we feel guilty. So for instance, social workers try to make the argument that, oh, child abuse wasn't an issue back then and uh, we didn't know that it was happening. Uh, however, we do in fact know that child deaths were reported and documented. So it's pretty appalling that social workers never responded to this in the past. In terms of the government, uh, they're constantly making promises that oppressive policies won't happen again and that they're going to really try to focus on Aboriginal and their community. But unfortunately, the government is not staying true to what they promised. They're really not following through because the programs and funding for Aboriginals um, is still lacking. What I really appreciated about Blackstock's reading was the emphasis on Aboriginal strengths. So to further prove that colonization is the cause of Aboriginal issues, Blackstock writes about how Aboriginals were before the Europeans even came and took over their land. Uh, so it's mentioned that they were able to solve child welfare issues on their own by transferring children to other members' homes. And they were also able to keep suicide rates down by using their community-based practices. So by realizing that Aboriginals were able to solve their own issues and probably still could solve their own issues, should be an eye-opener for professionals because oftentimes professionals feel like the Aboriginal community is in need of saving uh, when in reality maybe they just don't have access to the same resources that everybody else does. So um, Blackstock really makes us realize this and he provides uh, really good suggestions that I want to highlight. So here there are a list of suggestions that I pulled from Blackstock's reading and I thought I would just post them here on a slide so you could reference them if you want um, when you're completing your weekly learning exercise um, and hopefully that'll be helpful for you to just take a look at this. So the way I would like to end the lecture before I go on to the weekly learning exercise is I want to mention to you guys a quote from Blackstock's reading that I found um, really stood out to me. So the quote is, we have not been trained to stand in the shadows of our harmful actions. So the way that I interpreted this was that as social workers, we are trained to believe that we always do good. However, I believe that especially at York and York School of Social Work, um, we're different in the sense that we are always critiquing ourselves. So we're not just assuming that everything that comes out of our mouth is going to be perfect and good. Um, so we're critiquing ourselves and our colleagues constantly. So I think what is important here is for us to continue to be critical, not just in the classroom and while we're getting our degree, but also when we go out into the field. Because if we keep this kind of critical awareness up, then we will be able to reach our clients in the least judgmental way possible. And in turn, we will be providing the most support that we can to them. Okay, so now for the weekly learning, uh, weekly learning exercise. So I'm just going to read through what I would like you to do. So as we learned in the readings, it is crucial for us as social workers to be aware of how we may reproduce colonial beliefs when working with the Aboriginal community. So contrary to the belief of many people, Aboriginals are still being oppressed against today. As a result, I designed my weekly learning exercise to get us all thinking about how today's policies and practices are directly linked to colonization and assimilation.
So what I would like you to do is pick one issue that Aboriginals face today and explain how the issue is rooted in colonialism. So you may pick your own issue, or what I've done is I've just listed four here, so you can choose one of those, um, and these are from the readings, so you may be more familiar with it. So the first issue is Aboriginal children are forced to leave their reserve in order to attend school. The second issue is Aboriginal children in foster care are not always placed in Aboriginal homes. The third issue is not enough of the government's budget is being used for Aboriginal programs. And the fourth issue is the government does not provide supports for children on the reserve who have special needs unless they are in foster care. Okay, so thank you guys so much for listening to my presentation. I hope that you enjoyed it. I've put my email address here, so if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to contact me. I apologize for my first post. I thought the voiceover was working in the PowerPoint, but unfortunately it wasn't. So my post is a couple hours late, so I apologize for that. Um, hopefully this is all working for everybody. Um, if anything, please contact me and I will find another way to deliver the lecture to you. So other than that, I look forward to reading your posts and I hope you have a great week. Thank you. Bye.